You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Hey, good morning. My name is Alan Seaborn. I'm part of a ministry down the road here called Winning at Home. And I'm excited. You know, I'm, I wasn't really expecting this many of my people to be here today, the non-campers, right? So that's all of us. I've got a really nice mattress at home that's super comfy. It's way better than sleeping in a tent. So yeah, I, you guys get it. Uh, <laughs> so this morning, we're going to look at a passage from Luke chapter 15. And what we're going to be talking about this morning is the Father's heart. And, you know, I'm guessing that as you look up at the screen and you see this title of the message, I'm guessing that a whole bunch of us in here, we have a whole lot of emotions connected to this idea of thinking of God as our Father. Because that idea of Father has so many things connected to it from our relationship with our earthly fathers. And some of us might think of the Father that we have here on earth that is withholding of love, that would never say that he was proud of us. You know, I think of how many times you hear the story from people when they share their whole life story or you read a biography or something. So, so many people are living life to try to prove something to their dad, to try to win their dad's affection, his appreciation, his support or praise or encouragement. And then... There are others of us who, um, our, our earthly fathers were unpredictable. And one day they could be happy-go-lucky, and the next day they could be screaming and yelling and angry, and really, you had to be careful, really volatile. And then there are some of us in here who um, don't even know who our father is. And so when you think about what it looks like for God to be our heavenly father, you're going, well, I've got you know, some friends of mine. I knew their dads. I've got that to go off of. And I see dads in TV shows and movies. Maybe that's... So we start to think of God as kind of the way we think of our earthly fathers. And there are still others who, uh, who have experienced abuse, who have been victimized by our earthly fathers. And so we carry a whole lot of baggage into this idea of what it means that God is our Father. Because even if we had great relationships with our dads, there are still moments and still things that we can think back on. And that's my story. My dad and I are really close. We're great friends. But I think back on some things and I go, well, I, I hope that God doesn't have that characteristic that my dad had here on earth because I know how that left me feeling uncertain and like there was this sense of unpredictability at times. So we have to kind of check that baggage before we can talk about what it means for God to be our heavenly father. And throughout the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus refers to God as either his father or our Father, uh, in 152 different verses, which is overwhelmingly the way that he referred to God in heaven as Father. And so, who knew God better than Jesus? Who knows God better than Jesus? Nobody. We can trust what he tells us that our Heavenly Father is like. And so, Luke chapter 15 is Jesus explaining, through telling these three separate stories, these three parables, he's trying to help us understand what God is like. So the whole chapter of Luke 15 is in response to, at the beginning, Jesus was spending time hanging out with um, these kind of two categories of people that for the Jewish religious leaders, these people were the problem people. Jesus was spending time with tax collectors, 
These were Jewish people who worked for the Roman government. The Romans were oppressing the Jewish people. They were overtaxing them. And many of these tax collectors not only took the tax that the Romans required, but then they took a little extra so they could stick that in their pocket too. So these were people who they viewed as betraying their own country and heritage, and they were pretty hated in the Jewish culture. And the second group of people that they accused Jesus of spending time with were sinners. This was kind of the catch-all term for anybody who they saw as not living a life that was up to the standard that God had called his people to live. And they said, you know, Jesus, we have a problem. This was a a constant uh, bit of conflict that happened between Jesus and the religious leaders. We have a problem with you spending so much time with these tax collectors and sinners. And so Jesus tells, like I say, these three parables to try to help them understand the Father's heart for people who are lost, for people who are separated from the relationship that God wants to have with them. And so the first story he tells, uh, he tells a story of a lost sheep Now, parables, we're going to have to think about this for a second because I'm guessing not a lot of us in here have sheep. So when Jesus starts this story, he's like, suppose one of you had a hundred sheep. And we're like, that would be the worst thing ever, right? I have one dog and I can't imagine having a hundred of something that has their own will like that. So a hundred sheep, but this was something that his audience would have related to. They're like, okay, yeah, I know a lot of people that have a hundred sheep. And Jesus says, let's say one of them gets lost, wanders off. And he said, what you would do, what everybody would do, is you'd make sure the 99 remaining sheep are safe somewhere in a pen, you've got them secure, and then you're going to go off and you're going to try to find where the sheep would have gone. Maybe it's got its favorite little spot that it always goes to when it wanders off, but whatever the case is, you find this sheep, and what they would do is they would grab the two front feet and the two back feet and they would kind of get up under the sheep and carry it back home like this, over their shoulders, up and down the terrain that they're crossing. And this is work to get this sheep back home. And Jesus says, when you get home, you'd call your friends together and you'd say, hey, I I had a sheep that was gone, but I've got it back now. Let's celebrate it. And when he tells these parables, he's telling a story that the people around him could relate to, to tell a deeper truth. And when we see these parables, he's telling about what we're like and about what God is like. And so he starts with this first one, the parable of the lost sheep. The next one is the parable of the lost coin. He says, imagine there's a woman who has 10 silver coins and she can't find one of them. And we know this feeling, right? It's somewhere in the house. I lost my keys again. I lost my phone again. I lost the remote again. It's like it's got to be in one of two spots, right? So you start searching and then, no, okay, oh, I guess maybe I was in the middle of something else. You know, you find your phone and your keys in such weird spots, right? So she's scouring the house. She's looking under rugs. She's picking up couch cushions. They didn't have that, but just picture with me. This is what it's like for us. And finally, when she finds this coin, she gets her friends together and she celebrates. Because what was lost is found. And then Jesus tells this third story. The way that you've heard it talked about probably most of the time is the story, the parable of the prodigal son. But to fit with talking about a lost sheep and a lost coin, it could also be called the story of the lost son. And so Jesus tells this story. And he says there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of the two sons came to his father, and he said, I want to get my inheritance now. Now, I want you to think for a second, you know, because it's really easy to read through these stories in Scripture or hear them talked about and just go, okay, yeah, a son was trying to get his inheritance. But I want you to think for a moment what that would be like. 
I want you to imagine that I was telling you that what I did this last week was I went over to my parents' house and I pulled my dad out in the garage and I said, okay, dad, here's the deal. You know, you're getting kind of older and I'm, I'm getting most of this stuff when you die, right? I mean, I'm one of four, but I'm the oldest, so I'm going to get a little special treatment. So, uh, you know, how about you just go ahead and give me this car right now? Because it, it's pretty much mine, right? You're just kind of keeping it safe till you die. I'll just take it now. And then if I walked and said, in this, ah, Dad, I've told you so many times, I don't like riding lawnmowers. Why do you have the, can you just sell it and just give me the cash instead? Because, you know, you're just keeping all this stuff safe for me. It's really mine just until you're gone. This is what he did. He went to his father. And he didn't say these words, but he was essentially saying, Dad, what I value about my relationship with you is the stuff I'm going to get from you when you're not here anymore. Uh, I, don't, I don't really need the whole you and me relationship thing. If I can just cut that out and just get the stuff, I'm good with that. And I want you to picture, because this dad probably, in order to give his son this money, he probably had to spend some time selling some property, selling some of the land that he had, some of the flocks that he had, some of the other herds, I don't know. But you can picture that this wasn't a, okay, yeah, cool, I have a third of my entire estate just in my bank account, here you go. This took some work. And you can imagine that every sale that he made, every deal that he did, giving up some of what he owned, was just a knife through the heart saying, wow, my kid doesn't care about me at all. He just wants what he can get from me. So after that, after the father makes this happen, he gives his son a third of everything that he has, and his son takes off. And Jesus tells us that he wasted his money in wild, riotous, partying it up, living. And that, actually, the way we think about this story, the prodigal son, the word prodigal, means wasteful, reckless. This is the lasting image of what this son is like, isn't it? He goes out and he just blows through this money. And I think about how, uh, you know, we don't get a tax return every year. Sometimes we wind up owing, but sometimes I find out when we do our taxes, we're going to get some money back. And I'm like, sweet, that's free money. I'm going to go waste that money on the stupidest stuff ever. Annalise tries to stop me, but I'm bound and determined. You know, I'm like, this is good. We didn't know we had this. We got to use it on something that's frivolous, right? That's what we do. That's what he did. This is found money kind of for him. Free money. He didn't do anything to get it. This is like how, you know, you hear that most lottery winners wind up in a worse place within like a small number of years after they win the lottery than beforehand. This was the story of the prodigal son. He came into this stuff quickly and he lost it just as quickly. And so we find out that he's living in a foreign place where he was living it up, partying, and now he doesn't have any money. So he might know a couple people, but those people were kind of his partying friends. Maybe not his true, known you most of my life, want to help you out when you're going through a tough time, friends. And Jesus says the story gets worse from there because the place that he was living started to experience a famine. And, you know, in America, we don't have to worry about that stuff anymore. But in the ancient world, if it didn't rain when it was supposed to rain, and if they didn't have sun when it was supposed to be sunny, then the crops didn't grow. We've figured out ways around a lot of that stuff now. But that was a very real thing they had to worry about. So I think to put that in modern day terms, imagine, don't call it a famine, maybe call it like a recession. Things were tough. So he's already in a, in a bad spot personally. And then the place he's living is in a bad spot. And then Jesus takes it one step further for his audience. He said he was so, uh, so desperate 
that he started to work for a guy who raised pigs, which for a Jewish audience, uh, being around pigs, eating pigs, touching pigs, that would make you unclean and unable to go and worship God the way that you were used to worshiping God. So he's around these animals that for his background and for his whole world view, he's debasing himself just being around these pigs. And then Jesus says he was so hungry, he was wishing he could have the food that they were feeding the pigs. But nobody gave him any. So you get that this is just a descent, right? And when you're looking at the food that you're giving pigs, the lowest animal you can imagine, and saying, I wish I could eat what they're eating, this is rock bottom, right? And so Jesus says these words that are coming up on the screen now. Verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. I want to pause there for a moment because I think what he's doing in this part of the story is something that's relatable for a lot of us. He's going back to face the music, right? He's severed relationship. He's done damage. He's burned some bridges. He's said some things that now, in a moment of clarity, he's regretting. And he's walking back to have probably the toughest conversation of his entire life. And when I have to have those kind of heavy, I'm apologizing conversations, I do what I think he's doing here, which is going over and over, rehearsing this apology in his head. And it's important for me to do that because usually my first apology is something like, hey, I'm sorry that I did that, but you don't understand. I, there were all these other factors. I was going through a lot. And then I'm like, wait, that's not a real apology. Okay, I got to start over. And it ends up looking something like this. I'm so sorry. I, I, he goes a step further than I do. I don't even deserve to be called your son. And this is the apology you can picture. This is his walk of shame heading back home, and he's like repeating this over and over and over. And he's getting ready to have this big moment of confrontation, but deep apology. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. He's starting his script, his apology he was practicing. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father, he cuts him off, and he says to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And that response from the father to his lost son who had betrayed their relationship, who had done deep, deep damage to, I'm sure, his father's emotional stability and well-being. Instead of meeting him the way that we would normally expect, right? When we're going back and we're having to face the music for what we've done, we expect that it's going to get pretty ugly, that we're going to kind of have our noses rubbed in, the mistakes that we've made, the things that we said that we now regret, and the choices that we made. 
And you know, for Jesus' original audience, he was setting them up to feel that same exact way. He's telling layer after layer after layer of the story, and they would have been listening and going, oh man, when this kid gets home, this is going to be good because he's going to finally get what he deserves. There was actually uh, a ceremony that I learned about maybe four months ago, something like that. I met a pastor uh, named Pierre Ede out by New York, and he wrote a book called Our Good Father, looking at the entirety of the New Testament through the lens of God as Father. And he had something in there about this ceremony that would take place if a Jewish child were to leave home and go live among Gentiles, who were people who weren't trying to follow God the way the Jewish people were, and who squandered all their money, who wasted everything that they had, and then tried to come back home. There was a ceremony, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but they called it a kazaza ceremony. And if the elders of the city would see somebody who had went out and brought shame on their family and on their community and on their God and was trying to come back home, they would meet them out at the city gate and to symbolize the brokenness of their relationship between the community and this person trying to come back home, they took a clay pot and they smashed it on the ground and they yelled out, you are now cut off from your people. So this was the expectation of what was going to happen to this son. He was going to get what he deserved, right? And when they said you're cut off from your people, they didn't just mean like, hey, we're really mad at you. They meant you don't get to live around here anymore. You don't get to be a part of your family anymore. You don't get to worship anymore. You're done. You're dead to us. It's got that kind of a connotation. The same way this clay pot is shattered, that's our relationship now. You're out. And so with that in mind, one of the ideas about why the father ran out to meet his son was to try to stop this ceremony from being able to happen in the first place. He was trying to get out there before all the elders met his son at the city gates and said, you're done. So he's running, which by the way, for an older Jewish male would have been something that they wouldn't do. Running was kind of like beneath an older man, especially one that owned property and owned flock. This was a guy who was established. Established men in this society didn't run. So not only is he out there running to meet his son, but the expectation when there was this ceremony of cutting someone off, the expectation would be that the father, behaving in a like, hyper-masculine way, was supposed to stay home emotionally detached from what was happening. He was supposed to just sort of like, hey, you know, sorry kid, you made the mistakes, now you got to suffer these consequences. The mother could go out, she could beg for mercy, she could beg them to welcome their son back home, but the father, it was kind of the unwritten rule like, hey, I, I, sorry, you did what you did, now they got to do what they got to do. And instead, Jesus, as he's telling this parable that tells us about what we're like as we return home to the father and what God is like, when this father does the unexpected, when he goes out of his way to welcome his child back home. It's a powerful image, isn't it? And you know, sometimes I think it would have been quicker for Jesus instead of telling that story. He could have said most of that in one sentence probably. Hey, you know, the reason I'm hanging out with these people who you say I shouldn't hang out with. Uh, it's because God is forgiving and gracious and kind and he wants to welcome people back into relationship with him. And we would have thought, that's really cool, but that's not as memorable as this story. 
And I think Jesus wanted this image to be burned into people's minds when they think about, okay, I've got some ideas about what a father would do in this case. Um, But I'm thinking of an earthly father. I'm not thinking of a heavenly father. He's trying to help his audience then and us now understand that God's love and forgiveness and graciousness is so much bigger than what we picture it is. And I've got to be honest, as I'm preparing this message, I'm, I keep thinking to myself, like, man, am I overstating this? Like, is this too gracious? Am I saying something about God that's not true? You look at what Jesus is telling us, and remember, who knows the Father better than Jesus? And the words he puts into the Father's mouth at the end of this story, my son who was dead is alive again. My son who was lost is now found. And that right there is God's heart for us. So I'm guessing that there are probably some people in here um, who you hear that story, and you're like, okay, yeah, but I'm kind of waiting until I can uh, get my life together, get a little bit closer to where I know God wants me to be before I can really run to him. I want you to remember that part of the line in this son's apology is, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. But then he started making the journey back. And before he could say any of that stuff, his father was watching to see him coming back home. And he ran out to meet him. He embraced him, he kissed him, and he he threw a party. If you're waiting and saying, well, I know I don't deserve to be a son or a daughter of God in, in the state that I'm in right now, Are you thinking you need to get fixed up before you can come try to meet up with God? Um, What we see here is that he's waiting, he's watching, he's excited to welcome us home. I want to ask you to bow your heads with me. God, we, we thank you that this story of the lost son is in your word that we can read through and get a glimpse of what you as our heavenly father are like. And God, you are full of mercy and compassion and forgiveness and you love us extravagantly, over the top, in ways that we we can't wrap our heads around. God, I pray that if there's anyone in here this morning who has been staying at arm's length from you. God, I ask that your truth will break down those barriers, and I pray that you'll help us to see that we're not at arm's length because you're holding us there until we get our lives together. Um, God, it's because we don't think we're worthy. It's because we're not willing to listen to who you say that we are. God, we pray that you'll break through those lies, that way that we see our identity as primarily broken and disconnected and far from you and unlovable. God, help us to understand that you're longing to say, this son or daughter that was dead is now alive, that was lost is now found. Help us to trust you when you say that. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what a beautiful song. Let's leave from here today and go live as children of God. Let's trust who God says we are so that we can point people to our Heavenly Father. You're dismissed. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.